We're very lucky to have David M. Rubenstein as our guest this evening. Uh, Rubenstein, as I'm sure many of you know, has done incomparable work shaping the cultural landscape of Washington, D.C. for decades. Uh, in addition to serving as co-executive chairman of the Carlyle Group, which he co-founded in 1987, he is the chairman of the board of, tru uh, of trustees on such internationally renowned institutions as the Kennedy Center, the Smithsonian, and the Council of Foreign Relations, not to mention his role as trustee for the likes of the National National Gallery of Art, Brookings, and the Academy, uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and many, many more, uh, as well as his crucial support for DC's beloved National Book Festival. Uh, perhaps you even caught him here at Politics and Prose earlier this year, leading our teach-in on access to justice, tied to an issue of the Daedalus Quarterly Journal addressing the national crisis in civil legal services facing low-income Americans. So as you can see, his interests are vast, and the book he's here to present tonight showcases one particular facet, uh, his passionate investment in the study of history. Acting as a companion to his wonderful program for PBS and Bloomberg TV, The David Rubenstein Show, Peer-to-Peer -peer Conversations, his book, The American Story, released today from Simon & Schuster, we're very honored to be hosting the launch, uh, brings into deep, him into deep discussion with some of the greatest historians at work today, uh, discussing the figures that have shaped their lives and careers. John Meacham talking about Thomas Jefferson, Doris Kearns Goodwin about uh, Abraham Lincoln, Taylor Branch about Martin Luther King Jr., and many, many more. Uh, and as anyone who has heard his conversations with historians knows, Rubenstein has a very natural, thoughtful interview style and a phenomenal memory to boot that makes for captivating work, the likes of which fills this book. And in the spirit of the book, Rubenstein will be in conversation tonight. Uh, we're very fortunate to have David Gregory serve as moderator. Uh, you surely know Gregory from his TV work as a political analyst for CNN, uh, before that as moderator of NBC's Meet the Press, in addition to serving as a lecturer in the journalism department of, George of Georgetown University and a distinguished journalist in residence at American University. He's also the author of the book, How's Your Faith? An examination of his relationship to Judaism for which we hosted him right here. And now we're honored to have him back with David M. Rubenstein. So please help me give them both a warm welcome to Politics and Prose. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. David, it's great to see you. My pleasure to be here, and thanks for doing this. Oh, it's my pleasure. I love politics and prose. Doesn't everybody love politics and prose? Okay. My kids think I'm such a geek because I'll come here and I'll know people and wave to people. And they're like, Dad, it's not good when you know the people at the bookstore. Well, um, I come here a lot, too, because uh, it's the best bookstore in Washington, right? Yeah, exactly. So who's going to win the game tonight? Do you have a feeling about... The better team? No, I... The... <laughs> Um, you have to win. Everybody wins away, so the Nationals will clearly win because, you know, we won a seventh game, so sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the book is The American Story, and I've already gotten into it, and I really enjoy it. And, and the reason I really enjoy it is that you are a great interviewer, and it's a little actually annoying to me because I try to do one thing kind of well, and you decided to just pick up interviewing as this little side, this little <laughs> side job here, which you're very good at. Thank you. And what really happened and how I got into it, for those who want to know, is that uh, at my firm, Carlisle, uh, we would hire a lot of prominent former secretaries of state, former presidents of the United States to come in to make speeches at our annual events. And they were extremely well paid and the speeches were a little boring. So I decided maybe I could interview them. And they said, well, is the same fee that I would get if I'm giving a speech? I said, yes. OK, they don't mind because they don't have to prepare. So I did the interviews and try to add some humor. And then I became the president of the Economic Club of Washington. Vernon Jordan uh, asked me to succeed him. I told him I didn't even know what the Economic Club of Washington was, but uh, I succeed him. He's very persuasive, and he's the kind of person who it's easier to say um, yes to at the beginning than to say no, because eventually you'll say yes uh, to him. So I said yes, and then I became the president about 12 years ago, and uh, same thing. People came in to speak. I was supposed to get business people to come in. They were boring, and so eventually I said, let me just interview them, and it, I developed the uh, style of doing it, and then this came about. Let me just describe how this came about, if I could. 
Um, I thought that it would be a good idea to try to help members of Congress know more about American history. Why that's important, we'll talk about later. But they're they're passing they're passing the laws. So it's maybe it'd be good to know about history. And there's a famous uh, his, uh, philosopher at Harvard, George Santayana, who said, "Those who don't remember history are condemned to relive it." So I thought members of Congress are passing laws. It'd be good if they would learn more about American history. And I also thought it'd be a good idea if I could get them to come together in a bipartisan, nonpartisan way. So the idea was. I would uh, have a great historian come in. I would host a dinner. I would interview them. And we'd have uh, members of Congress from both parties. And they would sit together at the same table. In other words, Democrats and Republicans sit together. We're not, not allowed normally to do in public these days. And the people from the House and the Senate would get to meet with each other because they don't have conference committees anymore. So they don't really know each other that well. And so that was the idea. And we started in 2013 with John Meacham as the first one. And now we've had about 40 of them. And um, they've worked out pretty well. Members of Congress say, for better or worse, this is the most interesting thing they're doing in Congress. Now, that may ex exaggerate it, but uh, they like it because it's nonpartisan, it's not very public, and they can actually learn something about history. So that's that's the genesis of it. Then I took about 18 of the interviews and put them into this book. And, and I'm going to read from one of them okay. because I'm curious about the role that the study of history and history plays in your own public life. You're interviewing David McCullough, talking about John Adams and, of course, uh, Truman, both his um, incredibly, wildly best-selling uh, books. And he said, there's present-day time and then there's the time of history. And the best and most effective people in public life, without exception, have been the people who had a profound and very often lifelong interest in history. How has that notion inspired you? Well, um, I wasn't good in science subjects in school, so I gravitated to history where I got better grades. And I love history. And I now, because I live in Washington, I worked on Capitol Hill and worked in the White House, you have a sense of history when you work at those historic places. And so gradually, I just started reading more and more books about history. And I can understand them reasonably well. And I read as much as I can today. I try to read about 100 books uh, a year, two a week. Um, about history, biography, things that I, I'm interested in. And, um, you know, David McCullough is right. And I would just say one thing about David McCullough. He's one of the greatest uh, writers we have alive today. And when we, we did the event with him, members of Congress came with their dog-eared copies of his books, and they wanted him signed just like anybody else. And he has a very unique style of writing. Um, he writes a paragraph, then his gives it to his partner, his wife, who's been his partner in all his books. She then writes, uh, reads it back to him and he listens and says, okay, it sounds okay. It doesn't. And they'd go back and forth paragraph by paragraph. One time he told me a story where she read the line back that he had written and she said, you know, I don't really think that's a good line. That's a good sentence. He said, let's read it again. Uh, now it's okay. She said, no, there's something wrong with that sentence. It doesn't read right. He said, let me read it again. She's, he said, it's okay. She said, no, it's wrong. She said, God damn it. It's right. Leave it in. Okay. So the book goes out. And he gets a review, and the review is the review is Gore Vidal, I think it was. And Gore Vidal says, this is a spectacular book. David uh, McCullough is an American treasure, except he has this one sentence in this book <laughs> that doesn't really work. I, but, but that quote about, about the, the, the time of history right. um, and a lifelong interest in history. It has to resonate with those members of Congress, particularly, I know this was a few years old, that interview, but particularly during the time we're living in. Members of Congress, um, despite our jokes about members of Congress, I actually, in their defense, um, they get paid about $200,000 a year. So supporting a family, now that sounds like a lot, the average, the average income of a family of four in the United States is probably $65,000. So $200,000 seems like a lot. But if you have to support a family and two houses and people you're, you know, and send kids to private school, if you're going to do that, it's not that much money. And that's why some 75 members of the house live in their offices because they really can't afford to, to, to have a separate place here. Members of Congress care very seriously about what they're doing. And I, I think it's a terrible system we have, but they really do care about history because they recognize they're making history. And when you talk about a, a history in front of members of Congress, well, many of them, despite what you might think, they actually have read the books, they know something about it, and many times they come up and they they uh, talk to the author about things that the author has written, and they know the book quite well, and they ask them questions. I let them ask questions after I ask my questions, and they're pretty pretty good questions. I can't let your reading habit slip. It was farther down on my list, but very important right. to me. A hundred books a year, about two a week. Do you listen to books? Do you read the hard books? What do you do? 
Um, I don't listen to books because my hearing is probably not as good as it was when I was younger, so I probably don't listen to as many books. But no, I like to read because I um, I came from a modest family in terms of uh, intellectual attainment. My parents were smart, but they didn't have a college degree or a high school degree. And so I... Um, it, when I took me and got a library card when I was six years old in Baltimore, you could take out 12 books a, uh, a week, and I would take out the 12 books, and then I would read them that same day, and I had to wait a week to get more books. And my parents really couldn't afford to buy a lot of books, so I had to wait to the library to get the books. And I love reading, and I, I tell people that reading is what helped me get to where I am to a large extent. I love reading and learning information, and, and I think reading books as opposed to other things really helps concentrate the mind because a book takes much more time to focus. I, I read a lot of newspaper articles and a lot of new, newspapers and, and magazines, but nothing quite like a book because it takes a while to focus to get through it. And so the, my trick in reading these books is reading books I know something about, more or less. So if I had to read a physics textbook, I'd be still reading it three years later. I wouldn't get through that. The books I'm reading about are things I really like and I know something about, but also I interview a lot of authors. And my theory is that if you interview an author, you should read the book. And so it forces me to read the book. And so it kind of a force feeding me by, by interviewing a lot of authors. I read a lot of books. Is there a work of history that really stands out to you as one of your favorites? There are a lot of great history books. And I just interviewed one, uh, an author the other day in New York, Jill Lepore. Jill Lepore is a professor at Harvard. She wrote a 900 page book on American history. And I think about my little book on history, it's insignificant. Her book, um, was one which, um, it, it, she took, I think, three or four years to write it, and it's incredibly comprehensive. And amazingly, this is the first comprehensive book on American history, textbook kind of thing, written by an Amer a woman. We All of the great uh, you know, uh, textbooks or so forth, she said, were written by men. So um, it's an incredible book, and I highly recommend it. And I would recommend uh, a number of the books that we, we uh, in this book, but I'll mention one that's not in here. That is an incredible uh, story. We, we, I interviewed the, the author. Uh, her name is Annette Gordon-Reed. She won the Pulitzer Prize for a book called The Hemings of Monticello. And because the, the taping system didn't quite work, uh, we didn't have the, a really good transcript of that one for this book. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get it reconstructed. But, you know, she did an incredible job of explaining Thomas Jefferson's relationship with Sally Hemings. And to cut through a lot of it, uh, leaving aside whether what kind of the nature of the relationship is, why is it that Thomas Jefferson might have been attracted to her? There are many different reasons, but she was, um, uh, let me explain what I think one of the main reason, ma major reason was Thomas Jefferson's wife died when Thomas Jefferson was 39 years old. She said, I had a stepmother. Please assure me that you won't get married again so my children won't have stepmothers. So what is she, he supposed to say on his deathbed? Yes, I won't get married again. And he didn't. He was 39 years old. He moved later to France to be our ambassador. He took his oldest daughter with him. Later, his youngest daughter was brought over, but she was too young. She was nine, I think, at the time. So she had to be brought over by somebody as a chaperone. That chaperone was Sally Hemings. So Sally Hemings shows up in Paris with Thomas Jefferson's youngest daughter, and he sees his wife because... Thomas Jefferson's wife, Martha, her father was John Wares, and John Wares was uh, the father as well of Sally Hemings. He had impregnated one of his slaves, and the result was Sally Hemings, who I think was three quarters white. So he saw his wife as a 16-year-old, and I guess he fell in love with the image of his wife. And in terms of consent, I won't deal with the slave issue and consent, but it's hard to believe, but the age of consent in Virginia those days was 12. It had been increased from 10. So. It's interesting. I mean, some of these, some of these tidbits that come out in your own conversation right. with the authors, I thought it was interesting, McCullough talking about how guarded Jefferson was as a person who didn't talk a lot about his wife yes. compared to Adams. Well, Jefferson um, was a person who was a high-pitched voice, and he didn't like to talk in public. As president of the United States, he only made one speech, his first inaugural address. He never again made a public speech. He would communicate through having levees or the parties at the White House, often hosted with... Um, with um, Dolly Madison because his wife had passed away. And uh, he just didn't like to talk in public. And, and he was very private. He, we have about 14,000 of his letters extant. And they're incredible. But he just didn't talk in public. In fact, when the Declaration of Independence was being debated by the Second Continental Congress, they mutilated the draft that he had written. Mutilated, he said. They made 86 changes in his in his. Um, 
document. He never once spoke up because he just didn't like to talk in public and he would do everything by writing. He later did what many other people would do. He then took the copy that Congress had come up with and his copy and sent it to his friends and said, don't you think my version's better? Look at these two. But he's like anybody else. I just wanted to. How about some of the tidbits about how Washington, D.C. became D.C.? Yes. Uh, well, here's what actually happened. Um, when the Revolutionary War was over, we had the, the, the northern states didn't pay off the debts that they had incurred. The southern states had paid off their debts. So the, southern, so the southern states said, okay, we're paid off the debts. The northern states hadn't paid off. They owed about $70 million. Alexander Hamilton wanted the United, the United States, and he said, let's have the federal government take over the $70 million. The southern states say, wait a second, we already paid off our debts. Why should we pay off the northern states? Then. So one time in the early days of our country's history, um, when the capital was in New York before it moved to Philadelphia and then Washington, there was a dinner between Thomas Jefferson, uh, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison. And at that dinner, they agreed that the northern states would take over, would, would, they, that would be assumed by the federal government in return for the capital moved to southern area, somewhere around the Potomac. George Washington was given the, the job as the first president to come up with a place. He picked a place that maybe he had some land options nearby. We don't know. But he picked a place near his home, and that's how he moved down here. But he visited all he the vis potential spots, right? He was a surveyor, and so he did go visit all the spots. And um, he picked uh, this place on the Potomac that later became the federal city, later named after him. Do you believe, as someone who loves history in, in that great man of history concept, that there are great figures in history who actually determine the course of events? The, the historians have debated, is it events that overcome uh, great, great men and women, or is it great men and women who overcome events and make events? I, I think it's somewhere in between, but I do think, if you look at Abraham Lincoln as an example, most people, I probably would have said, look, the South is breaking away. Um, we can't really go to war with them. They let them go. We'll just run our country the way we want to run it. But he didn't do that. He said, no, we've got to stay united. And he fought the Civil War. And I'm not sure everybody would have done that. Very few people probably would have done that. And that's why by holding the union together and, and emancipating the slaves and so forth, I, my view, he's by far our greatest president. What are you after when you do these interviews? Um, what are you looking for? I mean, these are people who have written books, who have been interviewed a lot. What are you after in these conversations? I, I take about 45 minutes to do the, the interviews, and then members of Congress will have maybe 15 or 20 minutes to ask questions as well. Um, very often their questions tend to be statements, I wouldn't say, but uh, that's another matter. But um, I'm trying to get people interested in learning more about the subject matter so that they'll go read the book. And if, you know, my 45 minute interview is not going to give people enough information, but reading the book, I think would be helpful and getting people to read other subjects relating to it. So I'm trying to whet their appetite. And I try to do it by mixing a lot of the serious facts in with some humor um, about each of the people that, uh, that we're talking about. You are a patriotic philanthropist, the, the term that, that you right. coined. What is that? How did it come about that you uh, started okay. investing in okay. this way and, and giving in this way? You know, I started a company in Washington that became very successful. And as a result, I, I got more money than I ever dreamed of having. I never actually was interested in making money. I, it was not my goal. My goal was to go into government service and, and so forth and, and be a, a government person, political kind of person, no interest in making money. I wasn't that good at, at government because I worked for Jimmy Carter. We got inflation at 19%. The result was we weren't reelected. So um, I had to go back and practice law and my clients uh, convinced me that I wasn't that good a lawyer. So I had to do something else. So I, I kind of started a firm that became well-known, Carlisle, and then it did well enough so that I made a fair amount of money by any normal standards, not by Bill Gates standards, but by normal human standards, a lot of money. And so when you get a lot of money, what are you going to do with it? Well, you can build a pyramid and, and like the pharaohs, be buried with your wealth and take it with you. But there's no evidence you really need it in the afterlife. So if you eliminate that as a possibility, what you do with your money, you can do what most people have historically done with their money is give it to their children. There's no evidence that if you give a child a billion dollars a piece, a child is going to be better off or they're going to win a Nobel Prize because they've inherited all this money. Usually people that win Nobel Prizes or do great things probably don't have a billion dollar uh, in their bank account. So I didn't think giving my kids a lot of money was necessarily the, the right thing to do, but they may or may not agree with that. Um, and so then you can say, all right, I'm going to give it all away upon my death. I, people are often wait till they die to give it all away on the theory that they're going to be in the afterlife somewhere. They can see what it's being, what's being done with it. I'm not sure that I would qualify for that. So I thought I'm going to give it away while I'm alive. So when you give it away when you're alive, 
Um, Bill Gates came to me around the time I was thinking of this, and he said, they're going to come up with a giving pledge where you give away half or more of your money during your life or upon your death. And I said, I would do that. And there were 40 of us who initially signed it. Now there are about 200 of us who've signed it. And typically what you'll do is you'll give your money to education, medical research, and things like that. And 90% of my money goes to scholarships, uh, education, cultural kinds of things. Maybe 5 or 10%, a s small amount of what I do goes to these patriotic philanthropy things, but it gets 99% of the, uh, the attention because so few people are doing it. So uh, it came about not because I hired McKinsey and I asked McKinsey to come up with something for me to do with my money. It was by happenstance. Most of you know in life, serendipity is probably uh, uh, more influential in what happens than, than anything you plan. So I was invited to a, a viewing of the Magna Carta. Uh, it turns out that there was one of the 17 copies was for sale. There are 17 copies in British institutions and the Australian Parliament. One was owned by Ross Perot. He put it up for sale. It's the only one in private hands. I decided that I wanted to keep it in the United States because there was a risk it would leave the United States. It was the inspiration for the Declaration of Independence. And our, all of our colonies had charters that said you have the rights of Englishmen, which means the rights of of, of the Magna Carta. So I, I bought that and then I- Was, put, there, was there a lot of competition? I mean, to, there, there, in, in Well, the, the auction went on for a while and- uh, <laughs> Yeah, but they, they said you won, and then they came in and said, what are you going to do with it? And I said, well, I'm going to tell people what I'm going to do with it. I'm going to give it back to the United States as a, on a permanent loan, and when I die, it'll be there forever uh, to the National Archives where it is now. And then I said I was going to make it as a down payment on my obligation to give back to the country for my good fortune. And I started buying other historic documents, the Emancipation Proclamation, Declaration of Independence, putting them in place so people can see them on the theory that if you see the original of a document, it may be more inspirational than if you just see it on a computer screen. And if you see the original, you might before you go to see it or after you go to see it, you might actually learn more about it, read more about it, you'll be more informed. Uh, the same is true when the Washington Monument had its earthquake damage. I asked the, the head of the Park Service how long it would it take to fix it. He said a couple years. Congress will have to give us the money. We're back and forth. I said, forget the Congress. I'll put up the money and, and get it fixed. And ultimately, the Congress said they wanted some credit for doing something good, so they put up some of the money. But but then I just got in the habit of saying, what other things can I fix that people will go visit? So I did the Lincoln Memorial. Today I announced a, a gift to fix up the Jefferson Memorial so that it will underground. We will be out of education uh, things there. People can learn more about Jefferson the way we'll do with Lincoln Memorial. Same with the things I've done in Monticello, Montpelier. So the theory of uh, patriotic philanthropy is giving money or time or energy or efforts. I like to remind people that philanthropy is an ancient Greek word that means a loving humanity. It doesn't mean rich people writing checks. So if you have time, which is the most valuable commodity of all, give that. If not, give you know your energy or ideas. If you have money, you can give that too. So what I try to to do is say, I want to remind people of the history and heritage of our country, the good and the bad. So when I fixed up Monticello, I said I wanted the slave quarters to be built out because Thomas Jefferson, for all of his strengths, was a slave owner, and I, people should remember this. So I'm trying to remind people of the history and heritage of our country, and this is the reason. We don't know much about our country's history and civics anymore. We don't teach civics very much in high school anymore. We don't really teach history that much. You can graduate from any college in the United States without having taken an American history course. You can graduate as a history major in 80% of our colleges without having to take an American history course. The results are things like this. Three quarters of Americans now cannot, in a recent survey, cannot name the three branches of government. 75% of Americans cannot name the three branches of government. One third of Americans cannot name one branch of government. 10% of American college graduates think that Judge Judy is a member of the United States Supreme Court, <laughs> which is not yet the case. And amazingly, um, in a survey, if any naturalized citizens here, anybody a naturalized citizen, all right, naturalized citizens, if you're a resident here for five years and you take the citizenship test, it has 100 questions, you pass 60 of them, you pass 91% of people who take that test pass. The same test was given to, to people who are native-born citizens without studying, native-born citizens, and recently, and 49 out of 50 states, the majority of the citizens failed. Only one state, Vermont, did the people pass. So it just shows we don't know much about our history and so forth. So my theory is remind people more about history and heritage, and then maybe we'll have a more informed uh, citizenry. If we have more informed citizenry, maybe we'll have a better government. David, are you concerned at all about some of the forces in the study of history right now in America, a, a sense of you know, what we should remember, how we should remember, what we elevate about our past, what we shouldn't elevate, thinking about the uh, the memorials to right. uh, Confederate uh, figures and, and so forth? Well, yes, it's obviously controversial to some extent to take the Robert E. Lee memorials. When after Robert E. Lee, um, after he uh, agreed to not, he was given, he was offered by, uh, on behalf of Abraham Lincoln, the chance to run the Union 
army, and he wasn't given that. He decided not to take it. He said he would go back because he was a Virginian and run uh, the Virginia army, not even the Confederacy initially, just the Virginia army. And uh, he thought he owned, owed that to Virginia. Um, after the war was over, um, he was honored by some people, but um, it, the, the monuments to him really came about um, in the latter part of the of the uh, 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, really as a anti um, African American statement in effect, because it was really designed. He was supposed to be a symbol of segregation to some extent. So, I think a lot of those memorials built in that time were really designed for a different purpose than really honoring him. And I think we have to be careful about destroying the past. And we want to honor some people who've been great citizens in the past, even though today they don't look like what they've done is great. But I think many of those Robert E. Lee memorials were not done for the right purpose, I think. Of the copies of the Declaration of Independence that you have purchased, right. where, where are they? Where have you placed them? Okay, the, the, they are at the National Archives, um, the uh, Mount Vernon, uh, the U.S. Constitution Center, the State Department, um, Smithsonian, and so forth. And to make sure everybody understands when you say the Declaration of Independence, the original original is in the archives. It was signed on not July the 4th. It was signed on August the 2nd, mostly, because on July 4th, all the states hadn't yet agreed to come forward. New York hadn't yet agreed. So they came back in August. They signed it. That original was put in, in uh, display for a long time. It was it was kind of faded. Um, so it was it was when the British invaded, or was it the Canadians invaded? I can't remember. In 1814, I think it was the British. When the British invaded, when the British invaded um, in 1814, they, um, they, 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 the declaration was wrapped up, put in a bag, and hidden in Leesburg for a while. But it was not treated well. So um, it was eventually kept by the State Department and then put on display in other places. That later went to the Library of Congress, and uh, now it's in the archives. And when John Quincy Adams was Secretary of State, the son of John Adams, he said, this thing is fading. We ought to have a copy everybody can see. So we got a printer in Washington, um, named Mr. Stone, who came up with a Xerox kind of process. And nobody really knows exactly how it worked. And they made 200 perfect copies. Uh, those are stone copies, as they're called. And if you now uh, look on the 4th of July on the, on the New York Times, you'll see a copy of the Declaration of Independence. You're really seeing a stone copy because the original is faded beyond recognition. Fortunately, um, because of the stone copies, we know what it looks like. And I own uh, a fair number of those. There are another set of them that's the original original of the printing. In other words, there's the original one that's the, had the calligraphy that everybody sees in the National Archives. But what actually happened is on July the 5th, right after the text was agreed to, they went next door to Mr. Dunlap, a printer, and said, print up uh, a broadside, means on one page, the text of this. Nobody had signed it yet because they didn't sign it until August. But they printed up the text. They sent a copy to King George to read. They sent a copy to George Washington to read the troops and so forth. There are, uh, there were, I think there were 200 made of those. There are now 26 left. And one of them was owned by Norman Lear. And so he bought it from somebody who had found it in the back of a, of a, of a painting. And he bought it and for uh, $8 million. He took it to every state. And every state, um, he said it was the birth certificate of our country. They all saw it. Eventually, he sold it. And um, I, I didn't know. It was sold by Sotheby's, but I it didn't do it in a public auction. It was preempted by somebody. So one day, Norman Lear called me and said, David, I didn't really know who bought my copy of the Declaration of Independence, the a rare, rare copy of Dunlop, which were very, very rare, the original printed copy. Um, did you buy it? And I said, no, it wasn't offered to me. So one, a couple of weeks later, I'm in somebody's house, and I saw what I knew would be the perfect copy of the of the Dunlop, and it was perfect. It, it was the best copy that exists of the 26. And I said to the, the person whose house it was, did you buy that for $25 million from Norman Lear? He said, no, I wouldn't spend that much on the document. No, that's not mine. Are you sure? Are you sure? I know it's. I know what I bought. No, okay. Next day, the owner said, I forgot. I did buy it. He emailed me. Um, it was Bill Gates. And, and, and it's in his house now. Wow. wow. That's a great story. Talking about your, your government service. So you were an advisor to, uh, to President Carter. And I heard in one of your interviews that you did uh, that, that you thought of yourself kind of like Ted Sorensen with, with John well, Kennedy. That was well, a no, path no, you well, wanted no, to follow. No, no, you didn't, no, no. I'm not saying you thought of yourself that way, but you, you wanted to emulate that path. Let me, here's what, uh, what um, if somebody said that, it's fake news. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, what happened was, when I was in the sixth grade, uh, John Kenny gave his great inaugural address. It was the greatest speech he'd ever given. He wasn't a great speech giver, but he did a great job on that one. So it was only 14 minutes. Some of you may have remembered that speech. My sixth grade teacher went over that with me, word for word, line for line, and we kind of realized it was poetry in prose form. And it was really written by Ted Sorensen, uh, John Kennedy obviously was involved, but Ted Sorensen was a brilliant speechwriter. And so when I got ready to practice law, I wanted to go to the firm he was at, and I did work with him. 
And uh, he realized, though, I wasn't as good a lawyer as he was. So when the people said, you know, maybe you, you know, you should leave and do something else, um, he recognized that they were probably right. I wasn't a good lawyer. My clients didn't think I was get great. So Ted Sorensen helped me get out of the firm, helped me get a job in Washington, initially for Birch Bay uh, as chief counsel, and then later for, with Jimmy Carter. So I wanted to go to the White House, and ultimately, I thought maybe I could be like like him. Um, I would be the top advisor of the President of the United States when I was 31. I went to the White House when I was 27. So if we were reelected and I became the senior domestic advisor, replacing my boss, Stuart Eisenstadt, who I thought would become attorney general, I would have been the senior domestic advisor to the President of the United States. Now, that might not have been a good idea for the country because I'd managed to get inflation at 19%, made a lot of other mistakes. But the real problem was that um, I, I didn't have, obviously, the skill set of, of Ted Sorensen. But I think the country, Jimmy Carter's view is the rumor that I was going to be promoted to be the senior person in the second term was what kept him from getting reelected. Um, <laughs> it, it, may, it may have been the case. Uh, I don't know. Uh, were you at that time, and do you, do you secretly wish you were still a policy wonk and, and, and doing that kind of work as a career? Um, I don't know how many copies know, of the Declaration yeah, I don't, you I don't, might own. Yeah. If I don't think that there's that many people who are demanding me to go back in government service. In fact, I haven't not met a single person uh, since I left the White House who ever said, please go back in government service. You did such a great job on inflation and other things. So, um, But I do remember this. Be careful what you wish for. I was 31 years old. And I said, dear God, I know we have hostages in Iran. I know we have gas lines. I know we have inflation. It's 17 18%. But please let us run against an old, old man who's too old to get out of bed in the morning. Ronald Reagan, he's 69 years old. Nobody that old can get out of bed. Now I'm 70, so I don't feel that it's as old. I think it's like a teenager now. But in those days, I thought 69 was, you know, you're practically ready for a nursing home. Today, I didn't think, I didn't think he had the energy, but he, I was wrong. And therefore, I, I, I don't know that I want to go back and or nobody's demanding me to go back. But there's no doubt there's a lot of fun when you're a young man. I came from a blue collar background and three years after law school, I'm going on Marine One with the President of the United States. My parents are standing there, the South Lawn, they're seeing, you know, their kid get on the on the on the Marine One with the president, or I'm advising the president and so forth. So it was um heady stuff, but then in the you know, as we all know, it can't last forever and uh eventually uh, you have to come back to Earth. Let me ask you a couple a couple of questions about our current political economic reality and then we'll take your questions um for david uh on the economy are we headed toward a recession we have recessions every seven years on average since world war ii so eventually we'll have another recession we always have recessions uh we've been 10 years without one Right now, most economists would say we're not likely to have one in the near future because we're growing at about 2%. If we get a China trade deal, I think that will probably keep us uh, in reasonably good shape. But rem remember this, when we have the recession, all the economists who say we're not going to have one, they will pull a memo out of the file saying, I told you so, I told you, you didn't read my memo. So everybody always is hedging their bets saying we might have one of this or that happens. I don't see one in the immediate future, but exogenous events you cannot predict are the ones that often cause recession. So uh, who would have predicted that the subprime mortgage crisis would have caused a recession a long time ago, or now 10 years ago? But suppose China were to invade Taiwan. I don't know that they will. Suppose Israel were to invade Iran. I don't know that they will. Suppose Russia goes further into Ukraine. All these things could really slow down the global economy. So I don't think we can predict it, but I don't see one happening in the near future. Why do you think the economy, and particularly the markets, have proven so resilient in the face of the, the political instability we have? The strength of private equity uh, is probably a, <laughs> no. Uh, I think that uh, it's a global economy today, and I think the economy is not as dependent just on what happens in the United States. So uh, one of the reasons inflation is so low is we have people producing products and services from all over the world. It keeps prices down. We, uh, When I worked in the White House, roughly 25% of the workers in the United States were unionized. Today, it's maybe... 10 to 12 percent, much smaller because we're more dependent on labor and other uh, labor from outside the United States, for better or worse. Um, so I, I don't know exactly why the economy has been reasonably good, but it's it's been reasonably good for 10 years. Nobody can really explain it. What's your experience of the capital today? Our political polarization is so entrenched, arguably more than it's ever been. Our media certainly reflects that polarization. As you do business around right. Washington and the country and as you interact with all the folks that you do, what is your sense of the feeling here in political circles? When I worked in the White House, there were there's always political tensions between Democrats and Republicans, but it's much worse now. In those days, in the 70s, 
you had evening news shows, 15 minutes at night. That was roughly it. Then you had the front page of the New York Times, the Washington Post. There was no internet. There, there weren't tweet, tweeting. There wasn't uh, all the kinds of things we have today, social media. So it's much different. And, and I think today um, we do have tensions that are pretty bad. And I don't think they're going to get better anytime soon. But this is not as bad as we've had. There's nothing, nothing comparable to the Civil War. Remember, we lost roughly 600,000 people in that war, probably 3% of the population. Imagine we lost 3% of the population today with 330 million people. So that was in a different league. We have fighting back and forth, but people are not going on the floor of the center of the house and clubbing people over the head, which they've done before. So it's not wonderful, but it's not the worst we've ever had. I do think it could be, we, I'd be better if we had a better political temperament, but, but it's not going to probably change for a while. In this book, in your conversations, you're exploring leadership in the history of our country. What do you think are the leadership lessons of the political moment we're in now? Well, uh, John Kenny wrote a book with Ted Sorensen called Profiles and Courage, and um, it'd be nice if everybody reread that because it was a history of uh, people who did things that were courageous in, in the political world. Uh, today, it's much more complicated to, to be as courageous as maybe some of those great uh, leaders were. Uh, I think right now there is tension between the Democrats and Republicans that are pretty serious, and obviously between the legislative and congressional branches that are pretty serious. Um, one branch that is above it all, to some extent, is the judicial branch. I think while it has been attacked by some as being political, the truth is the judiciary, given the modest salaries they have, um, it, it, it's amazing how our judiciary is, is, has no corruption. Um, you know, the, the salaries of the chief justice, for example, is roughly $220,000, maybe $230,000. When he, one of his clerks leaves, those clerks get paid Two hundred thousand dollars as a salary and a four or five hundred thousand dollar bonus. So as soon as they leave him, they're making six or seven hundred thousand dollars, and he's making two hundred thirty thousand. Now, obviously, he's happy with his job and so forth. But uh, the judiciary is still very well respected. And let me just mention uh, the thing about John Roberts in this book. I interviewed John Roberts uh, because I thought members of Congress don't really know him, and it'd be good if members of Congress could see, you know, him uh, in an interview format. And he said, "Okay, I'm the chairman of the Smithsonian. He's the chancellor, so we work together." And he felt comfortable letting me interview him. So I said at the beginning, uh, uh, Mr. Chief Justice, did you always want to be Chief Justice of the United States when you were growing up? He said, no, I had no interest in that. Did you want to be a justice at all on the court? No, I had no interest in that. Did you want to be a judge of any type? No, I had no interest in that. Did you want to be a lawyer? No, I had no interest in that. Well, what did you want to be? I only wanted to be a historian. I told my father, I love American history. I want to be a historian. I really want to write history. And my, his father said, well, John, you know, it's nice to be a historian, but, you know, you write books nobody will read. You'll spend all your time in the library. You won't really support a family. He said, I don't care. This is what I want to do. So he went off to uh, Harvard, majored in history. And after his sophomore year, came back from Indiana, spring break, and he gets in the, uh, lands at Logan Airport and uh, goes to get a cab, gets in the cab and says to the cab driver, take me to Cambridge. His cab driver said, okay, are you a student at Harvard? Yes, I am. What are you majoring in? I'm majoring in history. Cab driver said, well, when I was a student at Harvard, that's what I majored in also. Um, <laughs> so John thought maybe his father had some good ideas. But uh, <laughs> What would you be doing if you hadn't built this little company, Carlisle? What would you do if it wasn't this? Well, i probably be... Um, Historian. Well, I don't know. Uh, my parents uh, grew up were from Baltimore, and when they retired, uh, they moved to a suburb of Baltimore, West Palm Beach, Florida. So maybe if I might be in West Palm Beach, Florida now, I don't know. I, I, I think I, like everybody here, you all want to be active uh, doing something that contributes to society and do something that makes life valuable. And let me uh, mention one anecdote about a person who reminds me every day about the importance of, uh, of trying to leave a good legacy. So um, in the 1880s, a man named Alfred Nobel is sitting in his breakfast table in Stockholm, and he is reading the newspapers, and he turns a page, and he says, and he reads oh, the obituary of Alfred Nobel. He reads his own obituary, and he said, wait a second, I'm, I'm alive. And, and what it said was, Alfred Nobel, the inventor of dynamite, the merchant of death has died. Thank God he's gone. He had been the inventor of dynamite. And it actually, a newspaper in fake news had said, uh, uh, got it wrong, his younger brother Ludwig had died. But it gave him a chance to reflect, is this the obituary that I want? And so increasingly, I asked people, think about this. Are you happy with the life you've led? 
And if so, congratulations. But what would you like written about you in your obituary? That you made enormous amount of money, that you had a lot of power, um, that people, um, you know, worship the, or your art collection, or that you had, did something that made society a little bit better in one area. You gave back to your country, you gave back to your society, your, your neighborhood or something. And I, obviously the latter is what I think people should do. And so I ask people to think about in this, if you were to write your own obituary, what would you want written? And if you're not happy about it, think about what you can do to make our country, our society somewhat better before uh, your time comes up.